by answering a couple of questions uh, actually one question which i have received in two or three different forms some by email some by uh, some on the on the chat just now um, and the questions are all based on the following misconception um, in a topological space Uh, S comma U, where S is a set and U is a collection of subsets. Uh, if S small s is an element of this set, then is 3S, 7S, pi S, minus S, etc., etc., also an element of capital S. And a lot of people think so. And it's because you weren't listening carefully. A topological space has absolutely no structure that allows us to multiply by numbers. Okay, You may be used to spaces where you multiply by numbers, but a topological space doesn't have that. Okay, And I can't emphasize this enough. When I talked to you about a space of table, lamp, writing desk, and laptop, it was not a joke. There's no element of that space, which is two times table lamp or laptop minus table lamp, okay? Be very, very clear about that. A topological space has only the, the set S has only the elements that I declare and nothing more. Now, every time you think of a space, you think of Euclidean space. In Euclidean space, you can certainly multiply an element by a real number. For example, if I have a vector at some distance from the origin, I can scale it up and down by multiplying with the real number, but that's a property of Euclidean space. It's not a property of general manifolds either. Okay, now let's try to see something that would go wrong if you just blindly start multiplying numbers into elements of abstract spaces. Uh, the lecture hasn't started, by the way, for those who just joined, I'm just addressing a question. Uh, supposing I had a space which had a disk missing. And in that, uh, supposing the origin was just chosen here for some reason, and I was considering this point x. So this is in my space, you agree. Now consider the set of points lambda times x, or lambda being a real number. If lambda is half, I'm here, that's fine. If lambda is two, I'm here, that's also fine. But if lambda is 0 0.1, I'm here, and this point is not in the space. It's not in the original set. Okay, so don't start multiplying elements of a topological space by numbers. Elements of a topological space are more abstract than numbers. They don't have addition, they don't have multiplication. Okay, I think that should answer an email I got just now whose subject is serious concern. And I, I feel the student had somehow decided he has sort of uh, found a basic flaw in mathematics, but unfortunately it's a basic fact about topological space, which is that you just cannot multiply elements of that space by numbers, that's not defined. The topological space only has elements, the set has elements, and it has subsets, which are the open sets. It has nothing else, literally nothing. It doesn't have an identity, it doesn't have an inverse, it doesn't have a multiplication. Hmm. So all the things you thought you knew, you need to give up when studying topology. Now, I tried to tell everyone this five left four lectures back, and I think some of you got it, but please, please, if you haven't got it, please don't read the notes. Please spend some time thinking over this point because it's crucial. If you won't give up your preconceptions, you wouldn't have learned topology at all. Hmm. Yeah, good. Okay, uh, summary is that a set may have other structure, it may not have other structure, it depends on the set. Statements in topology don't depend on that other structure, their statements purely in topology. Good. Okay, now let's get back to our subject, homotopy. Um, and last time we defined loops, we defined homotopy of loops, and we defined pi one of S, the fundamental group. And uh, this was defined through a whole set of, uh, of procedures, but basically pi one of S was the set of all classes, homotopy classes alpha, 
uh, such that, let's see how I wrote it last time. Um, where did I write it? My notes, sorry. Fundamental group, yes. Such that alpha of t is a loop in S based at x zero. Okay. So I pick any loop and then I make the class of all homotopically equivalent loops. And then I put one by one every class into this collection. I call it pi one of S. And on this, I have defined my, I have multiplication. I have identity, associativity, inverse. So all the uh, properties of a group. And so this is a group. And it goes by the name of fundamental group. Uh, also first homotopy group, very good. Now, uh, last time there was this uncomfortable issue, which I think light, uh, rightly many people didn't like, which is the dependence on X zero base point. Now, right now I'm going to show you how to get rid of the base point, but don't rush because you can't get rid of it completely. The bottom line is you cannot get rid of it completely, but under some conditions, you can get rid of it at the right stage. If you get rid of it at the wrong stage, you'll get a wrong answer and I'll show you an example. Okay, so please, a lot of care is required when doing this kind of subject, even very simple. I'm only describing like very, very simple things hmm, by the standards of mathematicians, okay. So what can we do about this dependence on X naught? So let's define a few things first, which will help us. So last time we defined the product of two base loops with the same base point. Now I'm going to define the product of two open paths. Remember a path was generically open. It was a loop if the endpoint was the same as the starting point, right? But now I'm going to take one open path like this. Let's call it alpha. It will start at x0 and end at x1. And I want to multiply it with another open path, beta, uh, which has some endpoints. Now that will be sensible only if the end point of the path alpha, there's an arrow here, huh? because this is the image again at t equals 0. I'm at the starting point here and at t equals one, I'm there. Now I want to multiply it by another, loop, another open path. So I should start that new open path at x1. So this is beta and it goes to x2. So alpha star beta is defined only if um, alpha of one is equal to beta of zero. Alpha of one is the end point of path alpha and beta of zero is the starting point of path beta. And the picture sort of shows you what the product should be like. Again, it only shows you the image of the product, which is a path starting at X zero and ending at X two, but we can simply define it in the usual way, uh, which is that um, alpha star beta equals gamma of T which is equal to alpha of 2t for t between uh, 0 and half and a beta of 2t minus 1 for half less than or equal to t less than or equal to 1. And this makes sense because we at half we get beta of 0 and we also get alpha of 1 and those two points are the same by this relation. So this makes perfect sense and gamma of t is again a continuous map. So the product of two open paths is also defined. I could have done this before defining the product of closed loops, but I didn't need it so far. Now I need it. Okay, now let me try to show you the idea of uh, relating. Uh, so let's relate, let's use this to relate two based loops with different base points. So I'll have one base loop whose image looks like this and here is X zero. And I have another one here whose image looks like that. 
and its uh, base point is x1. Now, there are just two different loops. Is there some sense, though, these are just examples, but is there a sense in which I can, given a loop based at x0, I can always find a loop based at x1, which is somehow similar. Now, here's a little idea. Let me do the following. Let me start at my new base point x1. I basically want to trace this first loop, this one, but starting from the point x1. So what do I do? Well, if I'm smart, I'll have an open path which takes me here. Then I'll go around this loop and then I'll follow my open path back to where I started. Okay, now if I do this and I follow identical steps in the beginning and end, these two overlapping paths here are really exactly the same. I didn't draw them exactly the same, but suppose they were, then obviously uh, all the topology that I'm trying to capture, all the non-contractible loops will be related to this loop over here, but it will be based at this point. I can now free up this point. It's no longer a base point of my new loop. Okay, so in this way, this is an intuitive description. Now I'll write the formula. I can take a base loop with a base point x0 and I can uh, define a new one with a base point x1. But before that, uh, let's anticipate some uh, notation which we are going to need. And that notation is from group theory. So first we need to define, uh, so for two groups, G and H, we'll define the following concept. It's called a homomorphism. Now a homomorphism is not a homeomorphism and that letter E is absolutely crucial. You know that a homeomorphism is a relation between topological spaces. Here, I'm talking of a homomorphism between groups. It's a different kind of morphism entirely. Excuse me, I have to open the door. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. So homomorphism is a map between groups. That's what the word means, okay? And it has to have certain properties. So is a map phi from G to H. So I'm defining a homomorphism from G to H. You can also define a homomorphism from H to G, but in general, it would be a different map. Given a map, we can def we define it in a particular order. And the idea is uh, that it's a map that preserves uh, group properties. Group, well, it preserves the group multiplication. Now a group, unlike a topological space, has a concept of multiplication. That means given any two elements of a group, there's something called the product or the combination of these two elements, which gives a third element also in the group. Okay. There's also something in a group called the identity. And there's also something which says that if there's an element, then there's an, in general, another element could be the same one called the inverse. Okay. So this map should preserve all these properties. So it has the following features. Uh, sorry, something happened here. Yeah. One phi of the identity. Uh, sorry, I should be very careful here. So one way to write it is, uh, well, G has an identity. Uh, then phi of I is equal to I prime, which is the identity of H. So it takes the identity of G to the identity of H. Okay, now uh, it's a map. So obviously for every small G and capital G, it will take it to some image in H. But in particular, G, if G inverse is the inverse of the element G in the original group G, then phi of G inverse is the same as first taking phi of G, now we are in H, Okay, and then taking the inverse in H. Yeah. Okay, and three, if G1 and G2 are two elements of the group, 
then phi of the product G1 times G2 is the same as phi of G1, which is in H, multiplied by phi of G2, which is also in H, using the product of H. Okay, I hope this is clear. This is something from very basic group theory. I don't know that everyone knows group theory, but whatever little you know about group theory should be enough uh, to tell you this. We described four group axioms last time, and basically the a homomorphism preserves group multiplication, and this is what it is. Now, a homomorphism can be very trivial. For example, supposing G and H are some very nice fancy groups, but phi, of, uh, phi from G to H takes every element of G to the identity in H, then it's obvious that everything I've written is satisfied, okay? But that's not a very exciting homomorphism. It is a homomorphism, just not a very exciting one. Okay, so in no sense a homomorphism tells you that G and H are the same group. But there is a stronger condition and a stronger type of map, uh, which is an isomorphism. So this is another definition of isomorphism G to H, okay, is a homomorphism. So it has all the above properties that is also one to one and on to, otherwise known as a bijection, bijective. Now we have some more fun because if it's one to one and on to, then there's a unique identification between elements of G and elements of H. That's what a bijection always does. And because that bijection is in particular a homomorphism, it also preserves the multiplication and group properties of G uh, when we go to H and vice versa in both directions, okay? So an isomorphism is a very strong, uh, this is also a definition, an isomorphism is a very strong thing. And if uh, there exists an isomorphism between G and H, then, you know, iso means same. So, and, and morphism to morph means to transform. So isomorphism uh, between G and H, then effectively G and H are the same group. This is really is an identification. Now, why did I say effectively? If I was a mathematician, I wouldn't have said effectively. G and H really are the same group because a group is its collection of abstract elements. But in physics, we often think of a group as represented by a transformation or a, or a process or a, or, a, or a change of something or a physical rotation of some axis or some figure or something, okay? Now, there's no need for those to be the same in G and H. G could be described in terms of rotations of a figure and H could perhaps be described in terms of, uh, I don't know, orientations of a dice. So it's up to you what you describe it in terms of. But the group is just the list of elements together with the product rule. Namely, when I multiply y one with another, what do I get, okay? And that in particular also tells me what are the inverses of every element. So that data is the same for G and H if there's an isomorphism. And I see a question briefly, I can read it. I shouldn't, I should restrain myself, but somebody asked if it's an equivalence relation and indeed it is. So this is an equivalence relation, which is something, a concept that I discussed last time. Okay, good. Now, why did I do all this? Well, because now I'm going to do what I promised, namely the following. I'm going to, uh, I am going to, oh, there's a terrible typo in my book. Okay, too bad. So I'm going to show that, um, so here's a theorem. Um, if a topological space, S is path connected, um, then pi one of S with base point X zero and pi one uh, of S with base point X one, where S, X zero and X one are two different base points are isomorphic as groups.
and it's very easy to show this. I just have to set up the isomorphism, but probably you already guessed it from the picture that I drew some time back, uh, which was, uh, well, I didn't actually, I rubbed it out, so I'll draw it again. It's basically going to come from this picture. Here is X zero, and here's a typical path in, uh, in pi one of um, S and X zero. Here's X one, okay, and another typical path in pi one of S and X one. Now, what I can do is that, okay, maybe I should, even last time I erased it, I think the reason I'm doing this is that you'll get confused, not that it's wrong. Uh, here's X one, here's X zero. What I'm going to do now is the following. I'm going to define a map phi. I have to define a homomorph an isomorphism, remember, from pi one of S and X zero to pi one of S and X one. And if I can show that this phi is a homomorphism and is one to one and on to, then it's an isomorphism. And then I would have proved this theorem. Okay, so what is the map? First of all, it says that if I start in pi one of S and X zero, and this for example shown here uh, is a particular loop that represents one class in pi one, then phi of that class alpha will be defined to be the class of gamma inverse alpha gamma, okay, where gamma is an open path like this. And this is basically the idea. So what does it say? Sorry, gamma is, I think, the orientation wrong, should be pointing the other way. This is gamma. So the idea is this, since phi is taking me from pi one of, from loops based at x zero to loops based at S, x one, it starts with a loop based at x zero, and it constructs for me this particular loop based at x one, namely start at x one, trace gamma in the inverse direction, okay, then complete, oh, sorry, then complete this loop as it was, and then trace gamma back in the forward direction. Okay, and that's what this thing means. This is the multiplication of different loops. Remember, this one is a closed loop, this is a path, this is a path, but the end point of everything is the starting point of the next thing, so this multiplication makes sense. Okay, and uh, it's very easy to show all the aspects of this, that this is an isomorphism. Okay, now because of this fact, um, so you, you have to use the various laws of multiplication and um, uh, the, the concept of a homotopy class and all, which I taught you last time, it's a two or three line proof that this is a homomorphism and also the fact that it's one to one and on to that's obvious from the fact that if I already have a closed loop based at X zero, I've told you how to construct the closed loop based at X one. And I can do this in reverse. Uh, and so with that, it's clearly one to one and on to for, for each one on one side, I can get a unique one on the other side. Okay, so it's easy to show that this is an isomorphism. Okay, remember what could go wrong here is if this condition didn't hold path connectedness. If it wasn't path connected, there's no guarantee that we would have a path from X zero to X one. Then we can't say this. So we can't say that the uh, pi one of S and X zero in that case is uh, isomorphic to pi one of S and X one. Okay, but okay. So if the above holds, that means these two pi ones are isomorphic then we can drop uh, all reference to the base point and write simply pi one of S rather than pi one of S and X zero or pi one of S and X one. Okay, so that simplifies our life. Now I mentioned that it does, it is important 
when you are allowed to drop the point x0 mention of that point and uh, the key thing to remember is this when i calculate pi1 that means when i find out all the equivalence classes under homotopy equivalence and find pi1 of s that time i must keep a base point when i finished finding the group pi1 of s and if the space is path connected then as an abstract group i can drop all reference to x x0 because uh, that pi1 is going to be the same regardless of x0 but don't forget x0 until you have computed pi1 now you may think i'm being unnecessarily fussy i'm the last person to be fussy i take all possible i cut all corners that i can because i'm a physicist but this way if you if you drop reference to the base point too soon you'll get a wrong answer and in one of the examples we are going to do soon uh, i will actually uh, show you that okay very explicitly okay time for questions there's certainly piling up um uh, a plus 0.5 b minus a belong ritam you are asking me the same question a is a table lamp and b is a writing desk what is table lamp plus 0.5 writing desk minus table lamp there's no such thing it's not in the set the entire set is table lamp writing desk and uh, what laptop there's nothing else in the set how can you assume what is what is 0.5 the set doesn't know anything about 0.5 your what you're assuming is a vector space structure okay a topological space is not a vector space okay uh, no sir this, this, no. yes i am just uh, answering that question i understand your point a plus i thought you wrote a plus 0.5 b minus a belong to the set yeah yeah the previous question was that and uh, if you see the previous question that was uh, like a plus t of b minus a yes that kind of logic yes so that's why i am saying that uh, a plus 0.5 or something that is not belong to the set you didn't write that, not belong you wrote belong to the set see what you wrote hmm if you were trying to say not belong i would have left it but you said you wrote belong to the set okay okay akriti a set could have anything yes why is this called multiplication of paths and not addition of paths uh, okay akriti thank you for raising that and i i think this is an important issue that in abstract mathematics you should know whether we call something multiplication or addition actually doesn't mean much okay um, you can refer to ordinary addition of numbers as multiplication it's just a word right okay however we carry one intuition and only one with us which is that addition is always commutative that is if i add one thing to another then i get the same thing as if i added the second thing to the first a plus b equals b plus a now in numbers ordinary numbers a times b is also equal to b times a but you already know that in matrices a times b is not necessarily equal to b times a and the combination of homotopy uh or you know of paths which i showed you uh i doesn't satisfy uh, is not is not uh, commutative that is if i multiply alpha with beta i don't get the same as beta with alpha in fact in this particular example that uh, i gave you um uh only one of them is defined because remember the end point of one path is the starting point of the other um and the reverse is not true okay so i can multiply alpha with times beta but beta times alpha isn't even defined it's just not defined so given that uh, with rectangular matrices you can have a similar uh, situation uh, so you know when multiplication depends on when combination of two things depends on the order we often call it multiplication uh, the mathematical term for all combinations of two things is binary pairing it says give me two things i'll give you one thing okay you can call it whatever you like but i'm calling it multiplication there's no uh, yeah uh, dhruv how can a path be open i didn't understand that question why shouldn't a path be open open okay open open means the uh, the two and the initial and final point is not the same i'm using open in not in the context of open set i never said it's an open set i said open path an open path just means one that starts at one point and ends at a different point that's what i mean by open hmm? okay um 
do we really need to state points one and two in the definition of homomorphism? Can they? I don't think you can derive inverse unless you know what's the identity. Anyway, I don't think, I think these are all fine points, unnecessary fine points. Isomorphism is an equivalence relation, Agam, yes. Isn't morpho related to body or structure? Sorry, don't have time to get into Greek if it is Greek. Uh, F star G doesn't G act first and then F. I think, uh, yeah, so this is not an action. So this is the this is the point. This is not a function. It's not acting on anything. We'll see that when we compose maps, then, uh, okay, so I, I may be wrong here. I'm not 100% sure. I believe this notation is correct because it's in my notes, but if I'm wrong, I'll correct it next time. Um, so the map is gamma inverse followed by alpha. No, no, this is correct. You see, I've defined multiplication of maps by saying that alpha star beta is first trace alpha and then trace beta. That's what star means, right? It's not composition of maps. It's multiplication, which I defined. Hmm. You're confusing it with composition of maps, which is I take a map from something to something, and then I take another map from the second thing to a third thing. That's not what I'm doing at all. Both my maps, alpha of t and beta of t, are from the same set, 0, 1, into the space. And I'm multiplying them. I'm not composing them. So no, it's not first. Yeah. So multiplication is first from the left and then right. Why not phi of alpha? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I've explained this. Uh, I missed the point of getting rid of the base point. What advantage do we get? We don't have to mention the base point every time. We learn that the, okay, good. Uh, what advantage do we get? Supposing my uh, set has a million uh, points, okay? Now I calculate pi one of S with one of the base points, I get a group. Now, how many groups do I need to find in order to completely tell you the fundamental groups of that set? One million of them. I need to calculate pi one of S for every base point x0 running over all infinitely many uh, elements of my set. Now, if my set is path connected, I only do the calculation once. And the theorem tells me that whatever I get by doing the calculation with the different base point will be the same group. So you think that's a benefit or not? I, I think reducing one million list of one million objects to one object is a great benefit. OK. Um, if space is path connected, will the groups phi one and phi two, which are disjoint, be isom? What groups phi one and phi two? I don't understand. I didn't mention any group phi one and phi two, which are disjoint. I have no idea what this means. Can can someone explain? Uh, how different elements of the homotopy differ? Okay, now in the next one hour, I'm going to do about seven examples. Okay. So please uh, be patient for that. Uh, beta inverse alpha inverse is also defined. Yes, that is true. Beta inverse alpha inverse is, is indeed defined and is the inverse of alpha star beta. And it has to be defined because every path has an inverse. Uh, element of homotopy, I, uh, thank you. Uh, how different elements of homotopy differ? Yeah. Number of holes and number of non-equivalent base points. Um, no, 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 not at all. Not at all. Agam, just be patient. Everybody be patient. I'm continuing now. Uh, uh, continuing now by telling you a few more things and then some examples. Okay, good. Okay, so we got rid of the base point and now the last definition practically is homotopy type. Now here, we are going to ask a different question. Until now, if you remember, we have been talking about uh, different loops or different paths in one space. Now we are going to bring in two different topological spaces. So let's suppose that S and T, let S and T be two arbitrary topological spaces. Okay. Now consider two continuous maps 
F0 goes from S to T and F1 is a different map which goes from T to S. They are only continuous, no other properties are assumed, not bijection, and F0 and F1 have no relation to each other in principle. F0 is a map from S to T, F1 is another map from T to S. Okay, now, oh, sorry, 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 awful thing I said. Two different maps, both from S to T. Dumb, that was a senior moment. So both are maps from S to T. F0 is one map, F1 is another. As I said, no, by not necessarily bijective or any other property, um, but they are both continuous. Okay. Now, the question we are going to ask is, is there some sense in which these two maps can be deformed into each other? But they are not maps from an interval to the space. They are mapped from an arbitrary space to another space. Okay, if S was actually the closed interval zero to one, then it would be uh, a loop or a path or whatever I've discussed before. But now I'm allowing for two spaces. Okay, now these two maps, these two maps are said to be homotopic. To each other if there exists a continuous map capital F from S cross zero comma one to T such that you can probably guess the rest F of uh, well, X, which is in S, and uh, my notation isn't ideal, I'll admit, and zero uh, is the first map F0, this one, and F of X and one is the second map F1. Okay, so you got used to the idea now that if I want to deform a map to another map, I introduce a new parameter, and I put uh, an interval in this particular case, this one, I just add it to the story. And I say that now I should have a map from my original space cross the interval to the final space, such that when I'm at the beginning of the interval, we often think of that as a kind of time, initial time, then my map capital F is small f zero, and at the final time, uh, capital F is small f one. Okay, but capital F should exist for all points between zero and one and be continuous. Please realize that this is not obvious, it's not guaranteed, it's not given. Hmm. If it is true, then these two maps are said to be homotopic to each other. Okay, so uh, if, yeah, and if it is true, we say uh, F0, the first map is homotopic to F1. Now, if you remember when we were doing loops, I put a, that symbol and a dot on top. The dot was, I should have told you, was supposed to represent the base point, okay? But in this case, we don't have the concept of a base point because we are not saying anything about the map. We're just saying it's continuous. We don't say it starts and ends somewhere and there's any beginning point and end point because the very concept of ordering doesn't even exist in a general topological space. There's no sense in which uh, table lamp comes before or after writing desk. It could you could do any ordering you like. Ordering is not built into it. So there's no initial point. There's no final point. I can't ask whether this F zero is open is a is has a different end part. I, mean, I, I I could ask a few questions, but it doesn't make practical sense to ask whether it's like a closed loop or like an open path. But um, uh, still, the concept of homotopy between F zero and F one is defined, and it holds only if such a map exists and is continuous. Okay, good. Now, why have we introduced this is going to be very useful because now we can give a nice definition. We say that two topological spaces um, uh, S and T are said to be of the same homotopy type 
if. Now, this definition has various parts and it's not uh, the, this, uh, 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 yeah, uh, has various parts and you shouldn't skip any of the parts. So if there exist uh, continuous maps, F from S to T and G from T to S, these are maps such that F composed with G from T to T is homotopic to the identity map in T and G composed with F, which is from S to S is homotopic to the identity map on S. Now, this, as I said, this contains a bunch of things. So let's be a little bit clear. Okay, F is a map from S to T and G is a map from T to S. They're not related to each other and they're only continuous and nothing else. Now F circle G means F composed with G. Now in composition, the instruction is act with G first. Whatever you get, act on that with F, composition of maps. Okay, so F composed with G, G acts on points in T. Okay, once G has acted, we are in S. So F acts on the point in S and once it's acted, we are back in T. Therefore, F composed with G is a map from T to T. Similarly, G composed with F is a map from S to S. This much is clear. Now, we say the spaces are of the same homotopy type. If such maps exist and the resulting map F composed with G is of the same homotopy type as the identity. What's the identity? It's a map from a topological space to itself. Okay, just takes every element to itself. That map is obviously a nice map and all that. It's a homeomorphism. It's anything you like it to be. But it's not obvious that F composed with G will be of the same homotopy type. That means deformable to the identity map. So if we want to say it in words, we say that there exist maps between the two spaces such that if I go from one to the other and back to the first, then I get a map which is in the same homotopy class as the identity map defined on the first space. And then the same thing is true if I start with the other map, come back and go forward. And then that composition is also homotopic to the identity map. Now, a lot of words um, were, uh, were used here and um, it will be much easier to follow once I give you examples. Now, actually, I'm pretty much done with definition and the rest of this lecture will be examples. So please, 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 please be a little patient. Once you see seven examples, things will become clearer. Okay, I've tried to capture almost everything I know that can be captured using these definitions with elementary sets. Uh, and you'll see them in a moment. Okay. But we just need uh, a few, um, a few. Okay, uh, what does it mean intuitively to be of same homotopy type? Not as much as you think. It doesn't mean, for example, that two spaces are homeomorphic. I'll give you an example of two spaces which are of the same homotopy type, uh, but not homeomorphic. What it does mean though, is that if two spaces are of the same homotopy type, then with a little extra condition, the uh, uh, fundamental group of the two spaces will be the same, okay? They're not the same space topologically in any other sense, but their fundamental groups will be the same. So uh, in fact, I might as well state that theorem right now. Theorem, oops, theorem. If S and T are two path connected topological spaces uh, and uh, they are of the same homotopy type as per the definition above, then uh, pi one of S is equal to pi one of T where equal between groups always means isomorphism. Okay, pi one of S and pi one of T are uh, isomorphic to each other. Okay, so basically being of same homotopy type just captures the fact 
that pi one of one is the same as pi one of the other. Okay, so uh, let's summarize. Uh, so a few comments. Let's make two comments here before we get to the examples. Uh, one. Uh, um, homotopy in general, the subject that I've been discussing from the last lecture uh, until now is a topological invariant. Uh, concretely, this means that two topological spaces that are homeomorphic have the same properties under homotopy, same homotopy properties. So, so if two topological spaces are homeomorphic, we defined that uh, early on, then, uh, and, and that if you remember is the existence of a bijective function, uh, which is continuous in both directions. Okay, then having the same homotopy properties means that they are of the same homotopy type, they have the same fundamental group, they have any other property that a space can have, which comes from homotopy, all properties are the same. Okay, in this sense, homotopy is a topo topological invariant. Okay, but don't try to believe the converse. Okay, so this is very important. Converse is not true. Uh, if two spaces have the same homotopy properties, they need not be homeomorphic. I've said this a few minutes ago, I'm just repeating it. Good. Okay. All this will come up in the examples. I think I've over advertised my examples uh, without doing a single one yet, um, but okay. Uh, I still need to give you two, two little definitions. One, uh, it's a, just a follow up of the previous one. So a, a topological space is called contractible if it is of the same homotopy type as a single point. A single point, I didn't emphasize it earlier. Uh, all of you were so bothered that I could have a topological space with three elements in it. Actually, I can have one with one element in it. The set S is one element. Uh, and the subsets are the empty set and one element. That's the only topology you can have, but that's a topological space. And now if any other topological space is of the same homotopy type as that particular one, then it's called contractible. Okay. And uh, we are going to check that in our examples. And um, definition, if pi one of S, the first homotopy group, I think I said it already, let me repeat it. If this is just the identity, after all pi one is a group, the simplest group is just the identity and nothing else. Then the space is called simply connected. Maybe I didn't say it. Simply connected. Otherwise, if pi one is non-trivial, it is multiply connected. Okay. So that's all the definitions and it's pretty much all the uh, theorems. Um, by the way, coming back to this theorem, it, this one, the proof is complicated actually. It's not trivial. You can look it up. I think it's in Singer and Thorpe, but uh, you know, this is not a trivial subject. I've only given you the proofs, which are very simple. In some cases, the proofs are very simple by construction. They're not always so. Hmm? Okay. Okay. 
So uh, I could look at 25 questions, but I'm afraid I'm going to answer all of them uh, in with my examples. But okay, uh, let me be very brave. I want to answer if I'm going to do it in the example. Uh, yeah. Domain of that S cross zero one is the Cartesian. Yeah, cross meant Cartesian among that is correct. Cartesian product of S and zero one. Uh, Topology on S cross zero one needs to be defined first, right? Not really. Zero one is the, uh, well, I didn't define it, but you could do it for yourself. Zero comma one is the closed interval in R. So it has a relative topology because it's a subset of R in the usual topology. And whenever we introduce an interval to represent time for a continuous deformation, I thought it was obvious, but maybe I should have said it. We always assume that that interval is uh, the usual topology inherited from R. Because what are we trying to do? We're not trying to learn anything about that interval. We want a familiar thing uh, which can parameterize the time, which takes us from some object in a space to another object in the same space. And that space is arbitrary. We want to learn about that space. We're not trying to learn about intervals. Okay. We assume that we already know what there is to know about intervals. So yes, zero one is always uh, the closed interval in the relative topology on R. Uh, S has its own topology, which is unspecified. And when I take a product, Cartesian product of two spaces, it's very obvious to decide what is the new set, which is the total space, and also what are the new open sets. They're just all R products. Can you explain what a continuous map means? Akriti, that was defined in the second or third lecture. A continuous map between topological spaces is a, um, is a map, uh, sorry, a continuous map from one space to another is a map such that it's inverse maps open sets of the latter space to open sets of the former space. Hmm? That's what continuous means. If, is F supposed to be continuous on 0, 1 or on S cross 0, 1? On S cross 0, 1, the whole thing. Okay, thank you for pointing these out. I forget to say them sometimes. It is the product topology. Sanjana is absolutely right. Sanjana has a record of being absolutely right so far on every single thing. Um, many of you also probably. What is the identity map between the two spaces? There's no identity map between two different spaces. Remember that the identity map is from a space to itself. Okay, let's go back and see where the identity map occurred. F composed with G is a map from T to T, not from T to S or S to T, from T to T. Okay, and I'm claiming that it is homotopic to the identity map which is the map from T to T, that's why it's called I sub T, which takes every element of T back to the same element of T. It's almost, it should be very obvious that any set whatsoever admits an identity map. We just take that set and take every element to itself. It's a map from that set to itself. Whether there are other interesting maps from a set to itself is a different discussion, but identity map is always there, okay? Identity map is different from a map which takes every element of a set and maps all of them to a common point in the set. And that's not the identity map. Identity literally means what it says. Every point goes to itself. Okay. Uh, not every open set in a product topology. Okay, only basis is products of open sets, not every. Uh, this may be true. Not every open set in a product topology is a product of open sets. That's certainly true. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dhruv. So yeah, technically, I, I should have actually said that this is correct. Uh, the product of the basis, I, I think I thought I defined product topology. If I didn't, I'm really sorry. I thought it's in the book at least. And if it's not, again, I'm sorry. You should take the basis of the two topologies, take the product by taking product of basis. And then remember, once we have a basis, we have to take unions uh, and intersections, arbitrary unions and finite intersections and make sure they are there, okay? So uh, the best way to see why this is so is imagine I took, so it, okay, I mean, uh, what I'm trying to say is if I have a product topology, uh, then 
the product of an open set from of one space with an open set of the other space is definitely in the product topology whether it is a basis element or not doesn't matter the point is that not all open sets in the product topology will be those because i can certainly take unions of products which are not products if you think about it i take the product of two open sets u1 and u2 and then the product of two others v1 and v2 and now i take the union u1 product u2 union v1 product v2 this need not be a product set so i have to add those in so one way to do it is by choosing a basis the other way is to say that well in the product topology i'll start by taking all product open sets and then i'll add anything else i need uh, which is generated by the unions and intersections of those yeah uh, abhishek we don't talk of an identity map between spaces ever that's correct yes exactly uh both of them are different but can you say what's the catch yeah i think i just said what's the catch the catch sanjana is that if i um, yeah it's it's just what i said if i take the union of products of open sets that union need not be a product but it should still be an open set if you want i'll give an example to illustrate that point theorem does not include include isomorphism of higher homotopy groups i haven't given any uh, definition of higher homotopy group yeah fine yeah yeah dhruva has given the classic example uh, let let me not spend time i have lots uh, more now yeah sanjana broke the leg well in spirit she was right still anyway a uh, product of sets mean in product topology no no product of sets is a very very general concept product of sets is a set which consists of elements each of which is a uh, a pair of elements one from this set and one from that set okay it's called cartesian product proof of being same homotopy type simplified for spaces where path connected and arc wise are same path connected and arc wise i believe are the same path connected and arc wise had the same it's the same thing just two words for the same thing uh, there is no distinction tanmay i don't know what distinction you have in mind connected is different but path and arc wise are the same thing the same thing precisely hmm? very good okay let's go on uh sure okay good examples now the nice thing is that not only we are going to see examples but we are going to um uh see that these have some kind of counterpart or some relation to objects that could occur in physics if i have time one of the examples will be actually from physics okay but first so examples oh. one okay r n is contractible and maybe this is not the well let i'll i'll do it in the order it's done in the book this may not be the ideal order okay good okay so what do we need to do we so to be contractible it should be of the same homotopy rn is the uh, n dimensional euclidean space it's the product n times in the product topology where each r has the usual topology okay now this is a space we actually know because its elements are vectors okay every point in rn can be written as a vector x with a vector sign on top with n components x1 up to xn and all real numbers entered in this n component thing uh, are valid points in rn good now how do i show it's contractible remember contractible means same homotopy type as a point so i need to find a map f from rn to a point p where p is understood to be the topological space of one point um and another map g from the point to rn so we have to find these and they have to be continuous and then they have to satisfy some things now this is particularly nice because um there's only one map from rn to p 
because the image is p so every point just goes to the same point p okay so this is obviously constant map hmm finding these maps is not very difficult it's the constant map because the image has to be a single point p so obviously that's the only thing it can be and it's a continuous map it's very obvious that the constant map is always continuous okay now uh when the when the target is a single point p what about the inverse map or not inverse map the other map g sorry i misspoke it's not any inverse g takes a point to rn now where can a point go to rn well it just has to go somewhere in practice it doesn't really matter where in our minds rn doesn't have any preferred origin but we can as well choose it to send the point p to the origin in rn or you can choose any other point makes no difference now let's look at the compositions f composed with g and g composed with f so f composed with g is uh, a map from p to p okay because g first acts by sending p to the origin and then f takes the origin and every other point in rn back to p so f composed with g is the map p to p g composed with f is different so f takes a point in rn uh, to p and then g brings it to zero so g composed with f is the map that sends every point in rn to the origin okay good now what did the definition say um so uh now i need to define so now i need a homotopy uh which deforms uh, which says the following uh so let's go back to the definition of contractible same homotopy type as a single point and same homotopy type is here it says that the comp composition map should be um homotopic to the identity in each of the spaces okay so we need to now check whether f composed with g from p to p is homotopic to the identity in the space p with one point obviously that's also the map p to p so this is done okay g to f is a map that takes the entire euclidean space and maps every point in it to the origin okay now is there a continuous map by introducing a new time which relates it to the identity map which maps every point in euclidean space to itself okay so we here we need to relate this map by a homotopy by a homotopy to the identity map x going to x okay so x going to 0 and x going to x are these related by a homotopy so what should the homotopy be it should be a map i think i called it capital f of x as well as a time type of parameter t such that when t is 0 i get um the constant map uh, this one and when t is 1 i get the identity map hmm and uh, now there's a beautiful answer it's t times x okay look at this map so this is the scaling map if you like every vector in rn is scaled by a factor t okay between 0 and 1 now if t is 0 then obviously uh, f of x and 0 is exactly z the point 0 so it's this map here and if t is 1 then it's x and that's this map here okay now there's still one thing to check are we sure that this map is continuous for all t and that it's a valid map for all t now here we are using something which is that when i take a point in rn and i slowly scale it down to 0 i shouldn't encounter any weird thing happening on the way and i would if there was any hole missing or any part of rn missing so i've used crucially the fact that no part of rn is missing because my space is rn with no nothing missing no disks removed no ball removed no points removed 
If I removed even one point, the story would change. I would not be guaranteed that this map here is continuous. Okay, it's continuous only because Rn is what it is, and because if x is a point in Rn, then t times x is also a point in Rn. This is not an obvious fact, and it's not true for the vast majority of topological spaces. Mm, it's very special property of Euclidean space. We call it scale invariance sometimes. Okay, typical spaces need not have this property. Okay, so anyway, we proved that Rn is of same homotopy type as a single point. So that was our exercise. Let's do, uh, and therefore Rn is contractible. Okay, next exercise is that let's consider the two dimensional sphere. Now, I'm sorry, there are lots of S's in my notes, and I really regret it. Uh, S is, can be an abstract topological space. But of course, when we discuss spheres in geometry, then uh, we like to use S. So it's a two-dimensional sphere. For uh, uh, an intuitive picture, that's the surface of what we normally call a, a ball, which is just the surface. It's the two-dimensional space, which is the surface. You can say it's the locus of all points in R3 in space, uh, which are equidistant from the center. Okay, that gives me a two sphere. Now I claim this is not contractible. Unlike um, Rn. Okay. Now uh, to show rigorously that it's not contractible, I need to show you that there is no map from S2 to a point and point to S2 uh, such that uh, the composition uh, the compositions are um, uh, homotopic to each other. So homotopic to the identity maps. But still, uh, I think we can actually show that in this case. Notice that this starts out being very similar to this case, Rn case, because the, I need a map F from S2 to a point and a map G from a point to S2. Again, this map is obvious. It just takes all points of the sphere to a particular point. That's obvious. And the reverse takes an, a particular point to some point in the sphere. Now, sphere also has no preferred origin. I'll just pick a point arbitrarily on the sphere. Okay. So, uh, so F is, F is, of course, is clear. Mm, just let's choose any G. G uh, let's, let's choose a point on the sphere. Let me draw the sphere. This is the North Pole, the South Pole. So let's uh, choose G that to take P to North Pole. And just a particular point on the sphere. Okay. Now let's look at F composed with G and G composed with F. Now F composed with G, uh, G takes P to the North Pole and then F takes the North Pole back to P. So again, it's the map P to P. And there's no problem. This obviously is a homotopic to the identity map. In fact, there is only one map from P to P. But G to F is a different thing. G uh, composed with F says that I start um, on, um, on the sphere with an arbitrary point. F takes it to P and then G brings it back to the North Pole. So this takes uh, any point on S2 to North Pole. Okay. Now the question is, we've got G composed with F. It takes every point on this sphere to the North Pole. It's a map, okay? Is it homotopic? Is this homotopic to the identity map on S2, which takes every point, any point on S2 to itself. So let's do a schematic picture. So G composed with F takes this whole sphere and every point on it is mapped to the North Pole, including the North Pole, obviously. Here's the North Pole. So every single point on the sphere, wherever it might be, goes to North Pole under G composed with F. Okay. On the other hand, the identity on the sphere S2 is a map that takes every point to exactly the same point. 
So this point goes to this, 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 and so on. Okay. Can these maps be continuously deformed to each other? Okay. Now, this is where intuition comes in. Of course, you can do a rigorous proof by going into the geometry of S2, and that proof does exist. But let's try an intuitive proof. What are we really trying to do? We are trying to find a motion on the sphere, which slowly, continuously, in a uniform passage of time, will send this to that. Okay. Now, how do we start about doing this? We only want to be continuous. In topology, that is the only thing we care about. And here, all the topologies are very well defined. S2 has the relative topology embedded in R3. Okay. Now, what do I do? Well, if I want to get closer from this map to this map, I can start deforming these lines so that every point goes a little closer to the North Pole. How does it look? I take this sphere and I kind of stretch it so that every point climbs up and up and up and comes closer to the North Pole. But now you can see with intuition, uh, which is actually the intuition that brought about the science of this mathematics of topology, that you have to break the sphere somewhere. For example, if you try to um, move every point along a longitude to the North Pole, where is the South Pole going to go? If it goes along this longitude, it's, not, it's going to be disconnected from the motion of its neighboring point, which went the other way. So continuity will break. Okay. So uh, the basic statement is that there is no homotopy. Acha, thank you. No homotopy between these two maps, and therefore S2 is not contractible. Okay, I'll take questions on this later, but I hope you understood that you know we don't have to always give the proof in equations as long as we know what we are doing. Once we understand that the goal of showing it to be contractible is finding a deformation from this map to this map, the lower one to the upper one, and we realize that this is not going to happen continuously, that's good enough at least for us to be convinced that there's no homotopy. Okay, now uh, let's look at a, the third example, and that example is S1. This is a circle, not the surface of a sphere, but just a simple circle. This is also not contractible. And the proof is essentially the same. I could have probably uh, given you the proof um, earlier than the previous case. Because again, if I want to make it contractible, then I have to be able to continuously move every point of the circle to reach the North Pole. And if I try that, there's going to be a discontinuity somewhere because there's no continuous direction in which I can move every point to the North Pole. Okay. And remember, for Euclidean space, that was not a problem because every point could come in continuously and there was no place where anything had to be snapped. But here, uh, there will have to be a snap if I'm to bring all points to the North Pole. So again, it's not contractible. So that settles the contractibility issue of S1. But now let's calculate. So contractible was trivial because contractible means pi1 is trivial. Okay, and what we've seen is that because Rn is contractible, therefore pi1 of Rn is identity. So I should have said it here, pi1 of Rn is just identity. So simply connected. Okay, now S2 and S1 are both not contractible. It turns out they have different pi1s. So let's calculate pi1 of the circle in the usual topology. And because the circle is path connected, I don't have to specify a base point. Okay. Well, for this, let's set up a collection of maps that we can think of. And then let's try to argue. Again, we are going to use intuition. Again, the proofs are there in the literature that um, these are all the possible classes of maps. We have to, pi one, remember, is not a set of maps, but a set of uh, homotopy classes of maps. Okay, so uh, what do we do? Uh, so we need to map zero, one to the circle. 
in all possible ways. I don't know why I put that point there. Maybe I had a base point in mind. Um, okay, let's put the base point here. Doesn't matter where it is. Okay, now let me list from my, again, intuition, um, what possible maps uh, I can think of, which are well-defined continuous maps. One, zero, one, all points in it go to x0. This is my base point. Remember, we should have an x0 when we start um, uh, calculating pi1. We can drop it at the end. So this is the constant map. OK, so here's a map. Now let's look at another one, which is not in this class, which is that, um, uh, Okay, so remember that zero one has to be mapped such that zero and one go to the same point, which is X zero, because this is a, I'm looking for loops in this space. Okay, so here uh, zero one, I'll take it to map like this. I'll draw the map instead of writing it. Uh, zero goes here and one goes here, just on the right of this point. And all these points in the interval go smoothly along this. So basically, I pick up this interval, uh, I detach it from my iPad, and I, with my hand, I wrap it around the circle. And now, uh, when I join the ends, I've got my property that uh, both 0 and 1 have gone to the base point. OK, so here's a map. And let's, there should be a direction, because remember, maps uh, are not just the image, but also the the sense in which we traverse the loop. So let me give uh, by convention uh, the direction to be anti-clockwise. Okay. Uh, if you want a simple way to think of this, you can start with a rubber band, which is like my interval, uh, where one of the points is zero and one, and I just follow the rubber band. Now in the first map, I put the whole rubber band on X zero. In the second one, I wrap the rubber band round my circle. In the third one, I'll do something a little more complicated. I'll wrap it twice. So I'll start at the base point uh, and I'll go this way, uh, but only in half the time. And then in the remaining half of the time, I'll again go this way and I'll close. I take a rubber band and imagine that this thing on the right is a ring and I have to wrap a rubber band on the ring. As you know, I could wrap it doubly Okay, and I get this one. So it goes like this, comes back like this, then goes like this, comes back like this, and then it's back to the starting point. Okay, you can easily write down the expressions, huh? mathematical expressions for these maps, but what we are doing is equally rigorous, in fact, because we're just describing those expressions in a situation where it's easy to, easier to use words. Okay, and now you, so now, um, uh, good. Now I can continue this indefinitely. Since my rubber band has no restrictions on its stretchability, I can just keep winding like this. Now I'm drawing these not exactly overlapping, but there's only one circle there and everything is overlapping. Okay, uh, so n times counterclockwise. Okay, so this is an infinite set of loops I've given you, one for every n, but I can also give you uh, two prime which is where zero one goes like this, the other in the other sense, one, two, three, n times any number, but the other way. Now my claim is that all of these maps are not deformed. None of these maps can be deformed into another one continuously. I can't take a rubber band that wraps a ring once and wrap the same ring twice with it without breaking something, okay? Remember, I'm supposed to continuously deform the map and at all stages in the deformation, it should still be a map. You might be thinking, well, if I've wrapped a rubber band on a ring, I'll take the rubber band off, take it to the next room, bring it back and put it back on the ring. This is not allowed, okay? The homotopy of loops requires that in the entire process of starting loop to ending loop, everything in between is also a loop. 
So the rubber band has to stay looped around that and it has to continuously go from wrapping no time to wrapping one time to wrapping two times to wrapping minus one times. None of these is possible without breaking the band and that breaking is the absence of continuity. So there's no continuous map which goes between this and let's write the summary of this. Uh, the homotopy classes of S1 are labeled N, where N is a positive, negative, or zero integer. If it's zero, it's this one, the constant map. If N is plus one, plus two, plus three, etc., it's the counterclockwise map. If n is minus one, minus two, minus three, etc., it's the clockwise map. Okay. And you can also see that the properties of this set of integers is mirrored by the um, multiplication of maps. The properties of integer under addition is mirrored by the multiplication of maps. Because if I have a map wrapping this way two times and another one mapping three times, then under the multiplication I defined, the net result is to wrap five times. Okay, why? Because the first map wraps me two times, but when I multiply, I'm supposed to finish that in half the time and then do the next map, which wraps me three more times. So multiplication here is acting like addition of these integers n. Okay, so n are called winding numbers. n is called the winding number and uh, n1 class star n2 class is nothing but n1 plus n2 from which I see that in this example and only this example the multiplication of uh, the of, of, of loops is abelian that means the order is uh, irrelevant if I do uh, first multiply the map winding twice with the map winding three times or, or other way around I get the same final class okay now notice that I've used this class thing here because I've only given you one map in each class. What are the other maps in that class? Well, the simplest map you get if you really use a rubber band is that the rubber band, when you have finished winding it and you let it go, will relax uh, in such a way that it wraps uniformly. Mm, its tension will smooth because it's an elastic object, it will smoothen itself over the ring. Okay, so your map will basically travel in time uniformly so that in a linear fashion, it covers uh, the number of turns it's supposed to make and comes back to the end. But of course, nobody said you have to do that. Okay, there will be other elements of the class. So for example, the class one has a simple map which just starts here, goes this way and comes back. Okay, this is the class n equals one. But it also has another map uh, this is the original uh, circle and I'm just drawing the other map. It starts here, then after some time it comes back, retraces itself, then it goes again and retraces itself a few times like that. And uh, after enough time, uh, basically after unit time, it comes back to its starting point. Now, uh, don't be fooled by how I've drawn it. All these motions are happening exactly on the circle. It's just zigzagging in time, okay? Now imagine, that's why people use rubber bands when they like to talk about topology. Obviously this map is simpler and this map is more complicated as a map. But actually they're homotopic to each other. And in this case, homotopy consists of saying, well, how nice, supposing somebody gave me this complicated map on the right side and I just implemented it with a rubber band, it would instantly spring back to the thing on the left side without breaking anywhere as long as the net amount that I traversed in going around was one turn anti-clockwise, okay? So what we learn from this is that the class contains many elements. It's a class, it's not a single map. And I've given you two possible elements in that class. Even the identity class, when we talked of the identity map, constant map, this one, uh, the simplest constant, the simplest map in that class is the constant map, but there could be non-constant maps in the same class. They start at the base point, wander, 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 and end back at the same base point without having made any full circles around the uh, S1, okay? They'll still be in the same class as the constant map. So it's not that 
the class n equals zero is not just the uh, constant map. There'll all be, there'll be infinitely many maps. That doesn't matter. Constant plus many others. What counts? is that net number of times it winds and that net number of times should be zero then it's in the identity class okay and now it's pretty clear that if i take the class one and i star it with the class minus one what do i have to do i have a map which winds once counterclockwise i multiply it according to loop multiplication with the map going the other way so that in half the time it goes around in the other half the time it comes back the net thing it has done is not to uh, circle the S1 at all. It doesn't wind around it. So it's in the uh, identity class. So everything works out. And we've learned that pi one of S1 is Z, a very famous theorem. And in particular, S1 therefore is multiply connected. It has a very non-trivial uh, pi one. Okay. We're running out of time and I have a few questions here, but, and we, I have a few more examples, but uh, there are two, which I think I need to really do, um, which, uh, and there are others I'll leave as an exercise. Okay. So first, uh, first example I'm going to, so the next example I'm going to do, this was example uh, at three. I'm sorry, my numbering system is a bit inconsistent, but okay. Let's do example four and five, and then we'll stop. For four, I'm going to take an interesting uh, space. It's not S2. Huh. First of all, I forgot to say one thing, S2. Let's look at S2. So we saw that it's not contractible, but what is its fundamental group, pi one? Now I could do all the calculation and write a lot of formulas, but basically it's the same question as asking if I put a rubber band on S2, any way I feel like, will it stay there or can it contract to a point? And the answer is you can always slip it off. You can't lasso a basketball is a famous statement. Okay. Uh, so there's no way for the rubber band to wrap S2. In S1, it couldn't go off in the circle, but in S2, even staying on the surface, it can always smoothly contract to a point. And therefore, pi1 is trivial. So let's say that for S2, pi1 is trivial. Pi1 of S2 is just the identity. This is described in more detail in the book, but there's a more interesting space called S2 mod Z2. And what is this space? I manufacture it by taking a sphere and I identify all pairs of antipodal points. This mod or quotient says that I take the space, but then I declare that every pair of points which is opposite on the sphere uh, is the same point, okay? Uh, there's a nice way to picture that, by the way, and this leads to something called projective space. This actually has the name RP2, real projective two space. The idea is consider rods uh, passing through the origin, okay? And consider the space of all possible rods. Now, a rod will intersect the sphere on two antipodal points, right? But it's a single rod. So if I just want to count the space of rods, I can't say that that's equivalent to the space of all points on the sphere. It's only equal to half the points on the sphere because if I take the rod this way or I invert it by 180 degrees, I get the same rod back. Okay, it's an unoriented rod. So it's like the space of lines. Projective space is a space of lines. Uh, okay, so this is the space and this space has some amazing properties and I want to calculate its pi one. Now, the first thing to note is that if I do this, then this is a closed loop in this space. Why is that? Because all pairs of antipodal points are identified. So S and N are the same point in this space, S2 mod Z2 or RP2, okay? So once I go from here to here, I'm back where I started, okay? But note that, and therefore it's a closed loop, but I can't move this point continuously to be there because the South Pole is the South Pole and only at the South Pole, I'm back where I started. If I come only up to here, I'm not back where I started. Only when I finally reach the South Pole, I'm back. 
okay so this path is a closed loop but it can't be deformed to the identity so this is a uh, closed loop uh, so this closed loop is not homotopic to the constant loop okay but the remarkable thing now is that two copies of it are homotopic to the constant loop and the way to see that is the following let's prove and then i'll stop sorry it's gone a little bit over time uh, so let's prove that if this was a path alpha let's prove that alpha is homotopic to alpha inverse it's homotopic to its own inverse from which it will follow that in the group multiplication alpha times alpha is homotopic to the constant loop let's uh, give that proof it's very illuminating but it may take you some time to get so the idea is very simple uh, with this loop i'm not allowed to move its endpoints i can wiggle the loop any way i like that's a continuous movement but the endpoints have to stay fixed so i deform it so that it goes behind the sphere same starting point same ending point if it was a thread coming down the front i just move that thread so that it's going down the back of the sphere i've done nothing it's continuous this is still alpha but now look at the antipodal map antipodal map says that every point on the back of the sphere up here is equivalent to the corresponding point on the front of the sphere down here so as i trace alpha going down like this under the antipodal map i'm basically going up like this and up that's important i'm going in the upward direction okay and that's this so we've just deformed alpha into alpha inverse in this special space s2 mod z2 okay so we see that alpha is homotopic to alpha inverse in s2 mod z2 and therefore alpha star alpha is equal to the identity and we haven't proved it but you can actually prove that there are no more classes okay in s2 there weren't anyway any non trivial homotopy classes in s2 mod z2 there is one homotopy class that of alpha the same as that of alpha inverse and there's nothing else so pi 1 of s2 mod z2 is actually the group z2 which consists of the two elements identity and you can give it any name a such that a star a equals i so here's an example where the fundamental group is not infinite it's not trivial it's in between it's just z2 just the cyclic group of two elements uh, which you can represent in your mind by a set of numbers 1 and minus 1 such that minus 1 times minus 1 is equal to plus 1 there are many ways to write z2 it can be mapped on to the group of roots of unity so anyway so that's the example i don't think i have time for more examples so i'll actually stop here uh, but let's take questions and if you are patient we'll have a little discussion because i think this has not been completely obvious so let me go through the questions um uh, Connectedness necessary uh, for isomorphism of their fundamental groups. Uh, you know, I think um, I do, we could write theorems without path connectedness, but I don't uh, know any space in physics that isn't path connected. So I just wanted to put it out there that that's a condition. Uh, let's not assume lack of path connectedness because it's not likely to get us very far. Lack of connectedness is very important in physics, but path connectedness not so much. okay um these are all old questions are all connected spaces contractible uh sorry i just proved to you that s1 and s2 are both non contractible and both are connected so i don't know how the question came up uh no it's not at all true uh since a point is simply connected are all contractible spaces simply connected you see Uh, all these questions were asked before my examples and i promised i would answer them so uh, sarvesh i hope it's clear that i have answered it the answer is no um, oh 
are all con sorry 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 sarvesh i think i read your question wrong are all contractible spaces simply connected ah ah good 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 uh, there's a theorem i thought i had even written it maybe i haven't uh ah yes 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 thank you thank you sarvesh i apologize i gave a hasty answer to your question okay uh yes theorem contractible yes absolutely correct sarvesh implies simply connected but simply connected does not imply contractible okay what are now i haven't proved this it's a theorem again um but uh, the proof is what sarvesh actually just said uh, since a contractible space is of same homotopy type as a point and a point is simply connected therefore it immediately follows that a contractible space is simply connected but what's an example of a simply connected space that isn't contractible we just gave an example uh, which is s2 the two sphere is simply connected every loop can be shrunk but it's not a contractible space yeah thank you sarvesh very good question can one just say that sn is not contractible yes one can also for s1 we can just say that given its fundamental group is non trivial that's proof enough that it's not contractible yes achintya that's correct so what i did was to start by saying well it's not contractible so let's see why and then we realize that the fundamental group is highly non trivial and that's uh, sort of uh, underlies the lack of contractibility for s1 that's not what underlies the lack of contractibility for s2 or other spaces but in case of s1 it captures the reasons why s1 is not contractible yeah uh, there's no continuous deformation to bring s2 to the north pole yeah uh i think uh, the next question is the one operative one removing the south pole would make s2 contractible yes so s2 minus south pole is indeed homeomorphic to r2 uh so is contractibleness a topological invariant yeah certainly i, I when i said that all homotopy considerations are topological invariant i meant exactly that anything that defined was defined using homotopy uh will be the same uh for spaces that are actually homeomorphic to each other uh, now coming back to ashwath i really don't know how to explain better why there is no continuous deformation to bring s2 to the north pole uh, i think what you need to understand is that every point in s2 needs to travel a continuous path to the north pole without breaking from all its neighboring points because the structure of s2 is that every point has open sets around it okay i can't break those now how do i get every point to the north pole i can do it if if south pole was not there i could do it by taking this whole thing to be a rubber sheet and contracting the rubber sheet until it smoothly comes to a point okay but i can't do that without breaking the rubber sheet and that's the south pole so the s2 because of you can blame it on one point is not contractible okay without any one point it would be contractible but it's a different topological space with a different structure of open sets namely the relative topology from the original s2 which got the relative topology from r3 yeah yes do these examples uh, in pi1 have any relation to winding numbers in instantons rajneel uh, yes and no it's not actually a pi1 for instantons uh, it uh, turns out to be pi3 or something so but i'm we'll we'll talk about that maybe sometime later in the course uh, but yeah uh, actually um, uh, there you know in a 1 plus 1 dimensional field theory you can have instantons and then pi1 is related and i i'll give that example next time uh no uh, rajat we cannot reduce the radius of the sphere to zero because remember it's the points which are on the surface of the sphere if we reduce the radius think what is going to happen intuitively we are only working with the surface of the sphere when you reduce the radius of the sphere points come into contact which are even on other sides of the sphere that's topologically a different thing basically what will happen is this rubber sheet will glue to itself okay that's not allowed stretching is allowed but two parts of the rubber sheet being glued is not allowed it's a different space in fact if you think of this example s1 mod z2 okay it's half of the sphere and it's not the same as uh, sorry s2 mod z2 is not the same as s2 precisely for that reason so gluing is also a discontinuous operation yes uh not being able to shrink the spherical surface without tearing the surface yes similarly the circle but you can shrink a solid 
boil down to a point, uh, Aditya, yes, absolutely correct. Uh, you have to stay on S2 while deforming. The operation you mentioned does not, ah, Rajat, okay, fine, that's an answer. Don't we have to define quotient topology before we talk about S2 mod Z2? Well, it's understood if I take the quotient, if I take a discrete quotient of any, uh, any space, it's eventually we are going to define this space as a manifold. Uh, the quotient is always taken in the relative topology, but there's no problem with that. Uh, it, it is a bit tricky. If you want to work out the details of S2 mod Z2, what does it look like? Uh, you'll see that it's a hemisphere, but then it seems to have a boundary, but doesn't actually have a boundary because half the equator is identified with the other half. So it's pretty complicated. We don't need to work out all that. The uh, proof that I gave, a kind of intuitive or easy proof that pi one of it is uh, Z2 is essentially correct. Um, yeah, shrinking the sphere doesn't actually have any meaning. You know, I can deform the sphere uh, in a way which preserves shrinking. Shrinking is only a reference to how that sphere is embedded in 3D. The, the sphere is, a, is an object on its own, okay? What I can do are to move points continuously on it. Anyway, let, let's, let's defer these things to the study of manifolds, yes. Is it obvious that in the last example, alpha can be continuously deformed to take it to the back? Yes, yes, it's obvious. Uh, it's obvious in S2 and also in RP2 because it's basically the same topology. There's nothing stopping us taking alpha to the back. You see, the beautiful thing of a quotient space is that you can work in the quotient space, but you won't go wrong if you're working in the covering space, which is S2. Okay, Every point in the covering space is represented by a point in the quotient space, but the mapping is two to one. Two points in the covering space go to one. So Nothing can go wrong with this loop as long as uh, I just deform it continuously. Uh, and maybe, I, yeah, maybe I can, you know, take it to the back and make it zigzag around the sphere, but there's really no problem. The open set structure will take care of that. So the, the, these kind of identifications do not uh, actually cause a non cause us to go over topology of the quotient space again. Basically, it's just what we think it is. Can I repeat the last example, Ritam? Okay, I'll try. One point compactification of a contractible space, a non-contractible one. See, what people call, yes, a one point compactification I haven't defined, but it, it's a process of adding a point to a space to get a new space. Yeah, and I haven't defined it, uh, but, uh, but if you want to see an example of what Ritwik has in mind, imagine I started with, uh, a segment of a plane and then I folded it and by stretching I made it into a perfect two sphere with one point missing. That's a continuous process. Now up to now it's contractible. Now if I add that point at the south pole it stops being contractible. So that's the example he has in mind. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Since we are deforming points continuously, antipodal points also move continuously. One thing, by the way, is that this antipodal identification, and I should have said that, has no fixed points. There's no point which goes to itself under that identification. Hmm? There could be other identifications. For example, I could take the entire upper hemisphere and map it point-wise onto the point below it in the lower hemisphere. Now the whole equator is fixed. Now there can be a real problem. In fact, this quotient is not a manifold, it's called an orbifold and it can have all kinds of interesting features. But the, the involution Z2 I took of antipodal, you see it necessarily takes every point to a point that's, that's not near it. That's why it doesn't mess with the topology. Yeah, good. Uh, thank you all.